This podcast is brought to you by LMU Munich. Yeah, so uh, now, now we get to relax a little bit. Uh, I'm going to give you some references to stuff in the literature. I'll read you a poem, show you some pretty pictures. And we're, yeah, we're, 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 towards, we're, towards, the, we're towards the end of the adventure. <coughs> okay, so uh, we spent a lot of time this morning talking about these tree duality satisfying numerators. Um, I gave you an algorithm to get them for all multiplicity, for all external states. Uh, but there are lots, lots of different ways, and a lot of them are really interesting. Because we still have a lot of mysteries about where, where this is all coming from, it's, it's worth, uh, worth checking out a lot of what's, what this is. So, um, Bern, Denon, Wang, and Kiermaier in 2010 started playing around with rearranging the action, the Yang-Mills action, so as to explicitly hard code Feynman rules that would give you duality satisfying representations. And they did this through six point. Um, and the way they did it is by adding zero to the Lagrangian, right? Targeting, targeting, how did, how did they add zero? They added zero in a very specific way. Um, color Jacobi, they added zero by, by tagging terms directly with color Jacobi. Um, so this is, this is worth looking at. And also in this paper, uh, there's a field theory proof of the tree level. So given a color kinematic satisfying representation, then, uh, then the double copy does give you the gravity amplitude. Um, turns out you can tease color, color kinematic numerators directly out of KLT. So this was the first uh, all multiplicity expression, uh, constructive expressions for color kinematic uh, numerators. And uh, Michael Kiermaier and then uh, our, our NBI friends and, and Pierre Van Hove. Um, <coughs> Tai and Zhang offered some really interesting insight into what's going on here from the heterotic string perspective, where they, they treat uh, color and kinematics um, in, in sort of the same footing. And then uh, our friends, uh, all of whom are in the audience, uh, Mafra Schlutter and Stieberger, constructed uh, through pure spinners explicit numerators that satisfy color kinematic uh, duality. Um, some really fun paper, uh, a really fun paper by Donald, O'Connell, and Montiero is uh, exploring very physically uh, self-dual Yang mills and self-dual gravity and how they're related and how, uh, how the, the color kinematic uh, duality arises in self-dual Yang mills, how that, how that translates uh, into gravity. And um, Donald, in particular, just uh, two weeks ago, gave a really nice talk at Banff that you can find online. It's, it was all streamed and recorded. And, and it's definitely worth uh, checking out. Um, they're, they're working on building effective field theories to come up with directly for these structure constants or kinematic structure constants so that um, some of the games I'm going to be talking about today, like, uh, like trying, to solve, um, trying to solve these functional relations by introducing Ansatze, no longer have to be played if you have, if you have the structure constant, kinematic structure constants. And so, but what I will be also talking about today is sort of applying loop methods um, to, uh, to come up with these tree duality satisfying numerators. Okay, <clears throat> so as I said, uh, if you impose anti-symmetry, you get the kleist coif relations. Um, after you impose uh, kinematic Jacobi, you get the n minus three factorial basis. And, uh, and this was actually then first proved uh, by our string theory friends. Um, turns out monogamy relations in open strings leads to string generalization of the n minus 2 factorial kleist coif and n minus 3 factorial relations. And, and therefore, there's a string proof of the field theory relations as real and imaginary parts as alpha prime goes to zero. So the real part of the monogamy relations yields kleist coif, and the imaginary part yields uh, n minus 3 factorial. It wasn't until uh, a year later, 2010, that we've got our first field theory proofs to all multiplicity. Um, and actually, just a couple months ago, Freddy Cacciozzo has a really lovely, uh, lovely proof uh, in field theory. Um, understanding the string roots of the n minus 2 factorial and n minus 3 factorial relations led to a complete pure spinner endpoint open disk amplitude in string theory in terms of color ordered gauge theory amplitudes. So here's, here's a full string theory amplitude, these are gauge theory amplitudes. Right, and these are uh, generalized Euler integrals, and so you can talk to uh, to all three of the authors, uh, 
over the next two days to, to get more insight. But there's some, there's some really beautiful structure happening, happening in here, and they're still investigating. OK, so one thing I didn't mention this morning is um, we've known since the beginning of time, or at least since the beginning of my time, that, uh, that, that Yang-Mills color ordered amplitudes in some sense contained all the information of gravity, uh, gravity tree level amplitudes. And this was manifested in these uh, Kawhi, Lil, and Tai relations, um, first written down in field theory in, uh, in 97. And you can see um, it's, a, it's, it's fairly complicated. There's a couple of sums over permutations. You've got uh, tree level amplitudes, tree level amplitudes, and then these kinematic factors sitting out in front involve uh, momentum invariance. Um, what you can notice is that these guys are expressed in terms of a basis where uh, n minus 3 factorial permutations. Um, these relations weren't proved in field theory uh, uh, until, until very recently. Uh, these were conjectured and tested to some huge number of multiplicity. but. Um, but after we saw these relations at n minus 3 factorial amplitudes, allowed a re-expression of these KLT relations into different basis amplitudes, left, right, symmetric, and so on. Um, these relations allowed proofs of KLT for gravity and gauge amplitudes in field theory by these fine fellows. And uh, generalized monogamy relations allowed rewriting of string theory KLT into a closed form momentum kernel. Um, still, a, a very natural way to get all these different expressions is to start with a double copy and express these guys in terms of amplitude encoded representations. And you can get all these fun sort of expressions. Now, the fun bit is that this, like right here, when you, uh, when you impose the color kinematic duality, when you make it manifest, this generalizes to loop level. Okay, before talking about loop level, I should also mention that uh, there are other algebras in the world besides our lovely uh, our lovely uh, Yang Mills, right? And one example is BLG, where you've got this uh, three, three relation. And so the Jacobi, instead of being expressed between three guys, is expressed between four guys. And uh, instead of cubic vertices, you have quartic vertices. And this is, this is the color Jacobi in this algebra. Um, and it turns out that in 3D, for this uh, 3D term Simon's Grace theory, they found uh, through six points at least, then and they expect it continues uh, higher, that um, that you can find kinematics that solve these relations. And when you take the double copy, you get uh, a maximally supersymmetric supergravity in 3D. Now, what's very interesting about that? Well, one, so this is a very cool result, right? This generalized notion of of color kinematics. But beyond that, is this is the same supergravity you get from double copying um, uh, Yang-Mills in three dimensions, right? Um, and it turns out that, that in 3D, everything except for the split helicity cases um, and an even number of guys. So all the guys with odd points vanish, and you get exactly these, uh, these, these gravity amplitudes in, uh, in 3D. OK, so this stuff is all. Semi-classical, the world's quantum wouldn't it be great to generalize to loop order corrections. We asked Jacoby, and he says we should always generalize, so we do. What's the right generalization? And it's that the same exact thing holds. You, hypo you hypothesize that you can always find these shifts such that whatever your representation is for your, for your gauge theory uh, loop amplitude at the integrand level, whatever the dressings you came up with to dress your graphs to satisfy a spanning set of cuts, that you can find a shift to get into a representation that satisfies, um, that satisfies the Jacobi identities uh, for all edges simultaneously. Um, of course, they satisfy anti-symmetry. That's part of, the, part of the whole game. If the conjecture duality can be imposed uh, for, for the gauge theory amplitude, then through unitarity and the fact that we know uh, we have a proof of tree level for all multiplicity, then the, the corresponding gravity amplitude at the integrand level is given by the double copy. And this is what we always wanted. Out of loop level relations, uh, since we've begun calculating these higher loop uh, scattering amplitudes in n equals 8 supergravity. Previously, the way we'd get there 
is we'd build gauge loops out of, out of unitarities, as we discussed earlier, this method of maximal cuts going, building these grand, uh, you know, for loop n equals four super yang mills. Then we'd have to cut down to tree level to rebuild gravity through uh, unitarity through KLT. And it's pretty arduous. Uh, but if we can write this guy in the correct way, then, uh, then we get gravity for free. Right, if we can make the color kinematics manifest here, then we automatically get gravity. <clears throat> and so to appreciate the concept, so that sounds like fun, but maybe, maybe uh, is, there any, is there any benefit for the gauge theory calculations? And, and it turns out there is. And one way to see that is to consider a villanelle, which is a very constrained poem. Okay, I'm not going to actually read the poem to you. I don't expect you to read it. But what I'd like you to notice is that for villanelles, all these lines are the same. And all these lines are the same. All these words rhyme. And all these words rhyme. So what's going on, you put a minimal amount of information in, and relations propagate this information to a full solution. Right? And this is exactly what happens with, uh, with our gauge theory amplitudes when we can impose the Jacobi relations. The Jacobi relations lock all these numerators to each other in very intricate ways. And they do so in such a way that you require just a small amount of information, the maximal cut of this guy, this one unitarity cut, plus imposing Jacobi relations, propagates that information out to the entire amplitude, um, which, is, which is fantastic. So, um, so you, you can say, well, how, you know, so, well, all right, before, before this even began, before we even looked at color kinematics at tree level, we knew there was something fantastic going on uh, at, at, at loop level, at least when there was no loop momentum involved. At one loop in the, in the, uh, in the fairly venerable paper uh, from 82, we knew that, um, that, that this, was, this was the numerator of this guy, and that for gravity, you turn the one into a two. And similarly, at two loops, that, that this was the numerator for this guy, and if you wanted gravity, you squared it. Yeah, that's fantastic. And so, and if you do look, and <coughs> we, we covered what the two loop n equals four super yang mills uh, numerator was, it does satisfy color kinematics duality, and I encourage you to check on every edge, impose the Jacobi relations, and check to make sure that duality is satisfied. It's pretty obvious, because the other diagrams that aren't here vanish. Right? And so you have the same numerator for both diagrams. OK, so this is the original solution for 3 loop 4 point n equals 4 and n equals 8. Um, and, uh, and you can see that, and this was, this was the solution for n equals 8 supergravity. For everybody here, there was this sort of double copy. But uh, these guys are definitely not double copies of this. And furthermore, while many Jacobi relations are satisfied between diagrams, certainly not all are. And so the question is, how do you find, how do you find uh, these shifts so that you're dressing satisfied duality? And every edge represents a set of constraints in the functional form of the numerators of the graphs. Right, so these, these are, so this, this, these, these numerators are mappings from graphs with labels that will, ch will change. And so, you, so these are real functions taking graphs to expressions, to kinematic expressions. And you want to, you want to find the functions that take the graphs to expressions that satisfy the Jacobi relations. Um, and the way to do this is you find the independent numerators, you, you solve the linear equations of the Jacobis between the graphs, you build an ansatz for the master graph numerators using functions you see on exploratory cuts, you impose the relevant symmetries, and you fit to the theory. Now, something I should mention is that you don't need all the Jacobi relations at all to, 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 to flesh this out. In fact, you just need a very limited number of them, ones that relate the, uh, the graphs to, to each other. Of course, you're going to impose all the Jacobi relations to make sure you're, if, I mean, if you want something that satisfies all Jacobi relations, but in order to solve for the independent numerators, you don't need every Jacobi. In fact, at three loops, um, you only need these guys. And by these guys, I mean the ones marked in red. So the Jacobis 
on each of these edges. And so you can see a Jacobi on this guy is going to relate a vanishing guy with a triangle, so he's zero, to, uh, to this guy. And then this guy relates this, a vanishing guy with a triangle, and this guy, and so on and so forth, right? So, so there's a Jacobi for every graph that ultimately relates everybody to this guy. And this are... Uh, the choice of, of the last slide is not unique. It is not unique, not at all. Um, in fact, this could have been the master, or this could have been the master, or you could have, you could have saved, I, I, I didn't have to reduce to one, I could have left uh, all the planar guys. I'll just keep the planar guys around and then express everybody in terms of this. But in terms of coming up with a minimal guy, it turns out, I believe this guy, this guy, and this guy satisfy. So E through G. Um, so for these 14, how many are independent? I don't, uh, what do you mean independent? Ah, I solve for everybody in terms of this guy. Yeah, I solve for everybody in terms of this guy. And uh, these guys vanish. Okay. And to see that, and so, and so you'll have access to these slides, and I'll point you to the relevant literature. But basically, you see A is expressed in terms of B, B is in terms of D, D is in terms of H, H is in terms of G and I, I is in terms of E, and G is in terms of E. So all of those guys are in terms of E. Who didn't I cover? Um, J. J is in terms of E. K is in terms of F. And F is in terms of E. L is in terms of G. And G is in terms of E. Okay. Okay. And so, and so, so you need you need these relations, and then you have all the numerators expressed in terms of in terms of the numerator of that one half tri uh, sorry half tennis court graph. Well, you, there, there, there's, some, there's some that you can obviously toss out, right? There's going to be, well, there's going to be loop momenta dependence, right? And these guys aren't going to carry any loop momenta. And so you're not going to be able to reduce in terms of them. Um, oh, I should point out, okay, so what are the arguments? The arguments are the three independent, so you, you assign canonical momenta. Oh, for this graph, the bit over here is going to be my first place, and this is going to be my second place, and this is going to be my third place. So you canonical external momenta. For every graph, you choose canonical internal momenta, and this is, these are the labels. You'll see that, um, that as you go from here to here, there's loop momenta relations between uh, D and H right, in terms of these arguments. These, these, these come out of the Jacobi relations. This is just coming out of the Jacobi relations. So then what you do is you give... E, wherever E is not here because <laughs> because he's not solved. He's the guy you solve in terms. So you give E, um, you give E an ansatz based upon you know external states based upon products of, of these K's and these L's, right? And you fix the ansatz by the symmetries of the individual graphs because in this case you can solve for symmetric representations. You solve you fix it in terms of all the Jacobi relations, not just these. And then you fix according to uh, whatever cut information is, is uh, required to, to, to get the theory. Um, and it turns out that after you solve for symmetry and after you solve for Jacobi, the, uh, the number of parameters that are left are completely constrained by the maximal cut of that E graph. So that's what I'm saying, is, is just a small amount of information you put in here, if you've constrained everybody appropriately, according to these Jacobi relations, propagates out to the entire solution. Um, yeah, and so this is, this is the answer. So this is the, uh, the Jacobi satisfying representation of n equals four super angles with three loops. And uh, because it's Jacobi satisfying, its double copy is n equals eight. So it's square, numerator by numerator is n equals eight supergravity. Um, you should, can note they both manifestly have the same overall power counting. Uh, and that's, that's kind of a cute trick if you're squaring something. Do you, guys, do you guys see how that happens? It's because all the worst behavior of n equals 4 
gets pushed into these guys, right? So they have less loop momenta running around in the denominator. And you square their numerators, their momenta doesn't get any worse, right? But these other guys who are subdominant, who are, who are, sub, who are uh, less important in terms of the UV of n equals 4, match then, as you square their numerators, the poor behavior of these guys. And so that's how n equals 8, after double copy, still has the same overall UV behavior of, as, as n equals 4, uh, 3 loops. You can say, what are these guys doing? Contributing to my scattering amplitude. Who ordered those guys? But this is, as I, so you see this S here? Right? I don't know if you guys can see this at all. But there's an S sitting in front, in front of each of these. It's eating that propagator, so it's a four, it's a four vertex. It's just a way of representing the four vertex in cubic diagrams. Oh, I should point out, uh, I, don't, I don't have the slide here, but remember, remember what I said earlier about how, um, how you don't need both copies to have the duality manifest? So that's something you can check also explicitly here. Take one copy being this, and one copy being the old representation of n equals 4, which also satisfies all the cuts, but doesn't have the duality manifest. And you do get the correct n equals 8 supergravity. It's, a, it's, a, it's an amplitude that satisfies. It is equivalent, uh, but it's got contact terms rearranged. It satisfies all the cuts. OK. Other loop level examples. 5.1 loop, n equals 4 super Yang mills, and n equals 8 supergravity is one master here, and that guy is de determined in terms of him. Two loop, this guy, everybody else is determined in terms of him. At uh, 5.3 loop, you can either have two planar guys, and everybody else determined in terms of them, or one non-planar, and everybody else determined in terms of that. Four loop planar, this was done in 2006. We didn't have, uh, I don't think we had for loop uh, non-planar until 2009, I think. Um, and the reason it took so long is because there's a fair number of graphs. But, uh, but when you pose the Jacobi relations, you, uh, you can express everybody in terms of these two planar guys or in terms of this non-planar guy. So this came out earlier, earlier this year. OK, oh, there's another cool, there's another cool bit. That's, uh, that, that happens here. All right, so remember, you can go up to, uh, you can build various supergravity theories by taking different double copies of gauge theories, different gauge theories build in different uh, amounts of supersymmetry in your, in your, uh, your supergravity theory. Uh, and only one gauge representation need to have duality imposed. Well, I just showed you a whole bunch of n equals 4 super Yang Mills amplitudes that we have the manifest duality imposed. And it turns out there are a whole bunch of n equals 0 and higher guys that don't have the duality imposed, but, but we know their expressions. So for example, um, uh, yeah, so example at 1 and 2 loop 4 point, clearly duality is uh, imposed. Um, so uh, the numerators at 1 loop are independent of loop momenta. Uh, and the same is true for 5.1 loops. So they can come out of the integrals, right? Um, and these guys <coughs> have fully integrated expressions at one loop four point and one loop five point. You can put this in with the numerators that come out of the integrals anyway, the double copy numerals, and have explicit n greater than or equal to four supergravity already integrated because you have these guys integrated. And so um, Zvi and Lance's, Lance's student Camille and uh, Henrik did the one loop double copy, reproducing explicit recent calculations of uh, Dunbar. Um, oh, and I should point out that these guys, this is, this is just something to check out if you're interested in supergravity calculations. These guys are doing some really strong stuff in N equals 4 supergravity, all multiplicity, one loop MHV they just got this past year, all multiplicity. And the way they're going after it is using these notions of soft and collinear factorizations. And what's cool about this is if you want to get into the double copy game, this is some really fun all-multiplicity data 
to, to try to match to. So there's, there's, there's data sitting out there to reach for. Okay, and so, as I said, the same was true for, for two loop four point. This is independent of loop momenta. Unfortunately, two loop five point isn't independent of loop momenta, so you don't get to, I mean, you actually have to uh, integrate. You have to integrate the guys together, but since, um, but since this is independent, you can pull it out. And uh, so Camille and Lance did that, did the first two loop n equals four supergravity calculation, basically by recycling this, this, all, uh, this old two loop four point amplitude that was in the literature. Um, yeah, okay. All right, so I've talked about the good, now I should talk about the bad and the ugly. Um, the, the bad is we don't know where, where this is coming from, where this uh, color kinematic duality is coming from. There's, uh, there's this understanding in four dimensions, specifically in four dimensions, the self-dual sector, and this is, this is really interesting, and it does translate to understanding some of what's going on in MHV, but this, this holds, th th color kinematics holds in all dimensions and doesn't care about the external uh, states of the particles. Uh, so, uh, you know, th there's something, something to be understanding here. Um, and another attempt to try to, to get, get hands on the notion of what seems to be a very, uh, you know, it seems to be a Lie algebra, this, this infinite dimensional Lie algebra, is to try to treat these amplitudes in some sense like, uh, like the color factors where, you know, typically we take a trace over color factors, here they did an a, a analog to tracing over kinematics, at least morally, to just try to poke around at relations. Okay, so the ugly, this is the ugly, is solving these functional relations. So we dearly love to have the kinematic structure constants to build our amplitudes with, right? but we don't have those. And as you saw, these were functional relations. And they're fine if you have the right onsatz. If you have the right onsatz, no problem. You, you know, you, you, you fit against cuts, you have some numbers, and then you're done. But if you're missing a piece, if you're missing a graph, if you're missing expressions of the right kind, especially if you think that things should be local in one way, and it turns out they're local in a completely different way, then you run into glitches, right? And glitches at two loops is no problem. Glitches at five loops can be a real headache. So, um, so we want to figure out new techniques for how to solve these guys. Um, and it turns out there's a, there's, a fun, there's a fun playground, a fun uh, sort of toy, toy model of, of having the same sort of grief, which is, uh, so at tree level, I said there was this nice, e at tree level, it's easy to find color kinematic satisfying representations. And it is, to all multiplicity. I gave, I gave you an algorithm. But if you impose symmetry, like that guy I showed you at four point, you run into the same problems. You have to solve functional relations. You don't have to worry about as many graphs, or as, at least as many topologies as at loop level, and the cut data is, is straightforward because you know what all the color ordered amplitudes are. So this is actually kind of a fun place to be playing around with, um, with some of these techniques. And so what I was gonna do now is just close out by, by showing you some of how these, um, how, how this, these onsatz solving games happen by working through just a couple, like four point and five point uh, tree level. And, and then I was gonna close out and just leave the rest of the time for questions. Are there any questions on stuff that I've uh, showed you, pretty pictures? That's exactly what I'm going to do right now. Okay. All right, so I just close, uh, close this business. All right. I won't need the projector anymore. Do I? Uh... Okay, perfect. Okay, so the goal is to re-derive the, um, 
the symmetric four-point numerator that I, that I started with this morning, okay? And so if you remember, the idea is you want an N, A, B, C, D, such that it's the correct numerator associated with A, B, C, D that makes all your symmetry manifest and uh, satisfies the Jacobi relations. Okay, so. So what you're going to need is an A. These are the functional relations you need to solve. Okay. There's other stuff we need to solve too. Color ordered tree amplitude. It needs to fit the data. It needs to be the right theory. I could point out. Um, so 2008, I think, is when we we found found color kinematics at tree level, uh, and it wasn't until 2000. I want to say 2010 that we found it at three loops, and you could ask why not, and the reason why not were those three extra graphs at the bottom, these nasty guys, and their, and their non-planar equivalents. Without these, you can find ansatz that have the right dimensions, the right momentum, uh, that, that completely solve all the Jacobi relations, and they don't fit to n equals 4 super yang mills. It's the wrong theory. And so that's no good with these guys, of course. No problem. So, but, what I'm, but in any case, not only do we want these numerators to solve the Jacobi relations, but we want them to give us the theory. So, oh, I don't know if I mentioned this, but SAB is supposed to be A plus B squared. So Jacob. No, 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 no. Still lost out. No, I mean, I'm basic. I'm going to rederive this. I'm going to spend so much time on four point because four point's easy. But, um, but, uh, but I'm showing how. So it's it, uh, solving this problem, finding the equation that satisfies Jacobi, and satisfies the the cuts, or in fact the color ordered amplitudes as well as the required graph automorphisms, which I'll write down right now. Okay. Okay. So what is this guy? This is, I don't know how obvious this is to everybody, but in case it's not, A, B, C, D should equal C, D, B, A. Yes? Yeah? Okay. Um, what else? It's got to be the anti-symmetry, because that's part of the whole game. So if I flip D and C, I get a minus sign. And similarly, if I flip A and B, I should also get a minus sign. All right? So these are functional equations. I don't know how you solve functional equations. The only way I know how to solve functional equations is to guess at an answer with free parameters and fit the free parameters. And so that's what we're going to do. But if you have a better way, you should come tell me. Okay. So what sounds that's going to be? All right. Um, I'm going to.
do it in terms of, uh, it's going to be amplitude encoded, so I'm going to let the color ordered amplitude store my external state information. I could express it in terms of 4 minus 3 factorial equals 1, color order its scattering amplitude. But the reason I don't want to is because then I've got stuff in denominators. And I don't know, it's just a little messy to have stuff in denominators. So I'm going to start with my ansatz with two the two guys who linearly span my space at four points. So, this is going to be one of my color-ordered amplitudes, and the other will be a D. That's not a D, that's a D, B, C. Uh, just to key us into where we were earlier today. Yeah? All right, so the ansatz, A, N, A, B, C, D, equals alpha. Alpha is going to be a number. S, A, B, A. Ah. <laughs> if I'm going to have these guys, right, as part of my numerators, so numerator is going to be amplitude times something, right? What's this something going to be at four point? That's right. Yeah, that's going to be, you know, yeah. Right? Just for, for dimensions. Um, OK, so what can I do? S, A, B, A, A, B, C, D. I've only got two independent Melda stems. At, uh, at four point, A, B, let's make this A, C, A, B, C, D, plus, let's see, A, C, A, D. Let's make it A, D. T is always friendlier than you. Um, gamma, S, A, C, A, a, D, B, C, plus delta S, A, B, A, D, B, C. Now, um, this plus this plus this. Uh, it turns out I've written the same thing twice. Who sees, who sees I've written the same thing twice? S A one two three four U A one four two three. Yeah? Alright, so I get to actually not include that guy because he's already included in that number. It's gonna be there. Okay, good. So this is the ansatz. This is what I mean by an ansatz. Okay, it's just an expression in terms of what I think belongs in my numerator. Everything I could think of that spans the space. And I'm going to stick it into my equations. Hopefully there'll be a solution. And that solution will peg these guys as numbers. Those that are left free, if there's any freedom, it's just freedom that comes along for free. Okay, and it turns out that there is no, well, here, let me. That this does, this does allow for a solution, and the solution is alpha equals one third, beta equals zero, and gamma equals minus one third. Okay? And when you plug that in there, and you rearrange a little bit, um, something mildly fancy happens. But it's suggestive. 
Okay, so now, now that we've got our solution, we can replace that guy with uh, SAB over SAC. Hey. Okay, so now everything's expressed in terms of the same in individual color order partial amplitude, and we find that N A B C D. can do is I can, if I multiply this by S and T, or S A B, S A D, S A B, S A D, so I just multiply by one, right? I've got this universal prefactor that always shows up in N equals four, super Yang mill. So this is, this is pure glue, by the way. This is just glue. Right, this has nothing to do with n equals four. I mean, it could be a, I, this could be a super amplitude. Then okay, I'm talking about n equals four, but this is this is this is also pure glue. Well, it turns out that the symmetric, uh, the symmetric representation has this universal prefactor divided by the relevant gram determinant for a four-particle interaction. Yeah, so. So for four point, I and J run from, for four point, I and J run from one, two, three. Okay. So that's what I mean by ansatz. Um, yeah. Yeah. With your indulgence, I'm going to do the same thing for five points as well. Okay? So the result is sort of interesting. The reason I'm doing this at tree level is because I really want to show you how to do these things at loop level, but it's too tiring to do it on a board or even too confusing to do in some sort of slide presentation. But it's exactly the same, right? So what was the ansatz? And for this guy, all right, well, what I knew is I knew there was a representation. I mean, I had a founder a representation. Okay, well, from dual conformal symmetry, I know that if this is K4 and this is L, then it's going to be K4 plus L squared, 1, 2, times S. This is, this is the numerator times that universal prefactor I keep talking about, STA tree. Okay, so this was, this is, this is a numerator, this was the numerator we first, uh, we first wrote down for n equals four super Yang mills. It is not the color kinematic satisfying numerator, but it has the right, it has, it has all the right dimensions, right? <clears throat> and for N equals four super Yang mills, where I had this universal prefactor I don't have to worry about that's present in every numerator, then all my ansatz has to do is basically span L dot K, L dot L, K dot L for the unique Ks and Ls, right? With the right, with the right power counting. Okay, and I give that ansatz to this guy, right? So it's going to be a product between, between, uh, between these, these types of inner products. And, uh, and I solve for Jacobi relations, I solve, uh, I solve symmetries, yada, yada, yada. And uh, then I fix on maximal cuts. So, just to be very explicit, alpha s squared plus beta, you know, s, K1 dot L1, if I was going to say this is L1 and this is 
L2 and this is L3 and so on and so forth. Of course, because this is n equals 4 super Yang Mills, I can assume, well, I can, may not, it may prove to be incorrect, in which case my ansatz won't work and I'd have to back off this assumption. But typically, we found that you don't need loop momentum running around boxes in your ansatz. This is just a handy experimental thing we found. That, in fact, the only loop momenta that ends up showing up in the numerator is when you have more than boxes, when you have a pentagon or hexagon or septagon. Um, in which case, you get various powers of L that bring you down to boxes. And we've also found, traditionally in n equals 4, that you don't have one-loop triangles or one-loop bubbles or one-loop tadpoles contributing these diagrams. It doesn't mean that it won't show up ever, but it turns out for uh, ons that say that have worked out so far, we haven't needed them. Okay, so this is, this is the sense in which there's an ansatz, uh, or what, what an ansatz would look like. Um, now, uh, interestingly enough, when we did um, one loop five point, we didn't have this magical, this magical K4. Nobody said, oh, hey, there's this universal prefactor, right? So we had to do exploratory cuts and tease out the types of structure that would appear and then put that into our ansatz. It turns out that, uh, that the representation that's been sitting around in the literature uh, for a long, long time uh, was actually, <laughs> actually satisfied to, to our, our great surprise, color kinematics. Um, but uh, I can, I, I'll, get there. I'll get there in a little bit. Uh, because it is actually relevant, interestingly, to the five-point story. So, so five-point. Are there any questions? Any questions on this? So, this with the, I guess I suppressed the n over d's, uh, that's, uh, that's the cut condition that must be satisfied, that's, that's fitting to data. Simil symmetry relations. Okay, you can have one. We're twisting this guy, so that's going to be A, B, C, D, E equals minus N, B, A, C, D, E equals minus, I'm twisting the other guy, N, A, B, C, E, D equals from flipping that guy over or flipping him around minus N5, D, E, C, A, B. All right. How many Jacobi identities? Functionally, how many Jacobi identities? Right, but functionally, I just have to write down what happens to this guy for this and what happens to this guy. 
Or no, I just just for this one graph. I'm, so, I, so I'm going to say this same function is yet too. Right. So this same function is going to be dressing everybody, right? So I only need to write down the Jacobi on this and the Jacobi on this. This guy is going to come over. It's going to be like B, C, A, D, E. So I'll read it that way. And 5, D, E, A, B, C. Plus, okay, it's going to be the U of it. So it will be... Even to jerk right. That's great. T E B C A. Okay, so this equals this plus this. And then the other guy. He's going to come over. So it's the U. All right, so. Okay, what's that going to be? That's going to be N E C D A B. So these are all the functional equations that need to be satisfied. Read this as a functional equation. Read, read the n over n over d here. Where, where did I? Oh, you know, it's floating around. And yeah, many, many, places. many places. Sorry, it's just this is the numerator for five, for five point. Sorry, just had it in my notes. So th this is this is going to be the symmetric numerator for five point must satisfy this. OK. Anyone want to guess in the generic form of the ansatz? An ansatz? Very good. With with what sitting out in front? Two yep, two metal stones. Very good. Yeah, S S A one two claw. Right. It's a natural guess, and it turns out to completely work. It is a perfectly fine amplitude encoding representation. I mean, so yeah. So you you give uh, each of these guys a parameter. You'd solve for them. Um, I'm not going to write the solution down. 
So I don't think it's particularly instructive. Uh, other than what's interesting, there is something that's interesting, is, uh, is that what you'll get is you'll get three blocks if you write it the right way. OK. And inside this block, the antisymmetries rotate. Inside this block, the antisymmetries rotate. Inside this block, the antisymmetries rotate. I th but in order to actually satisfy the Jacobis, you need all of these blocks to show up. Um, I should mention where you can, where you can go to look, look these guys up. So this is a paper with Brutal. How do you, you pick all the, the independent ones? The right one, there's no, I mean, so, so conservation momentum means there's a fixed number of k1 dot k2 is independent or, de you know, so you write down all k1 dot k2, k1 dot k3, k1 dot k4. If I have k2, yeah. All independent variants? Yeah, all independent all variants. Independent. That are independent. That are independent. Yes. Possibly. Possibly. I mean, you know, this is true. The, sure. But the, uh, this isn't the end of the five point story. Um, and I actually don't, I don't think this is the most interesting numerator for five point. Now, you can ask yourself after having imposed this, and having found a solution that correctly reproduces the data, satisfies all the symmetries I asked for, <coughs> satisfies Jacobi. Oh, and I should point out, okay, when you have this, all right, this is in terms of, right, this half-ladder diagram. Um, Color dressed tree, you know, one, two, three, four, five. You sum over all permutations, you introduce a symmetry factor. Okay, this is the color dressed amplitude. Right? Yeah, I didn't write it over, if I had written it over all like the uh, S unordered, then I wouldn't need the symmetry factor. But since I just wrote it over, over all the different permutations, you need the symmetry factor to avoid overcounting. Um, and it satisfies the Jacobi relations. It's manifestly crossing symmetric because you're summing over S5. Right? Um, you double copy your gravity amplitude is going to also be manifestly crossing symmetric. OK, so that's, that's something that's, that's nice about this solution, because it's nice crossing symmetric representation of five point, five point tree gravity. Um, but, but, OK, so what you can ask yourself is, I, I told you earlier, th there's actually a fair amount of gauge freedom in finding Jacobi satisfying relations. This we just stuck in an ansatz. How can we tell if we've exploited all the gauge freedom, or is there additional freedom to be had here that we just set to zero? Any ideas? Well, unfortunately, the only way I, uh, the only reason I suspected that, um, that there was additional gauge freedom is because I had another ansatz that I had in mind that I thought should work here that's quite distinct from this guy. And it relates to the five point multi loop n equals four super Yang Mills scattering amplitudes. Okay. Ah, well, all right, so here. 
Okay. This is a one loop pentagon. It, um, for one loop, uh, color kinematic satisfying representations, you can solve for things in terms of the n-gon as your master. All right, so even though you have an integral reduction, which I'm sure you guys have heard time and time again that you only need boxes for your massive series and, and below, it turns out the right way to talk about color kinematics is to allow your pentagons to run free. And of course, since we're talking cubic diagrams, this means also contributing to your scattering amplitude will be this guy. But this guy, you can see, you can express entirely in terms of this guy, the numerator of this guy. From Jacobi, you can express entirely in terms of this guy. OK? All right. This guy, one loop, a color kinematic satisfying numerator for this guy. We call beta 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And originally, Henrik, I found, but it matched the result in the literature, is this guy. You'll notice this is the first time you've seen me use a spinner product in almost 360 minutes. Um, So this is the kinematic numerator for this guy. The, the, the gamma, the gamma, the guy that dresses this guy is just like okay, a gamma one, two, three, four, five equals beta one, two, four, five minus beta two, one, three, four, five. And in fact, gamma is completely symmetric in these guys, in these guys, so in general, we just specify the first two indices. All right, so he involved, he, this guy encodes all the state information, all the external state stuff um, for, uh, for five point. In fact, uh, to all multiplicity, it looks like this guy and the, uh, this guy and his independent friends so, so permuting these arguments, you can use to encode all the state information the same way at four point, you can use um, STA1234. And in fact, Henrik and I have shown this by explicit construction that at uh, two loop five point and three loop five point, that I can stick all my external stuff into these guys and then just worry about momentum invariance again. Just nice, simple ansatze. OK, and so the natural question then is why can't I have an ansatz like beta, you know, the sum over the independent betas divided by an s, right? So it's going gonna, it's gonna to be one, one momentum invariant down from the loop. Um, now, one thing to notice is that there is no way this ansatz is at all equivalent to this numerator. One way to notice this is that this guy has a, this guy goes right here, this has a big pole if you go to three dimensional momenta, right? These guys don't, quite happy in three dimensions. Okay, so you're not gonna get, you're not gonna get this, you're not gonna get this guy in terms of terms of this. This is also for when T1 T and T2 are the same, for example. What yes. does it mean? What does it mean? In terms of beta, yes. Um, so you're saying if K1 and K2 
happen to be exactly the same momenta. Um, what does it mean? Uh, Uh, yeah, so well, what I can do is I can multiply, yeah. Wait, what? Yeah, and the, and the, the subtraction between them? Yeah, but I, I don't know. I mean, maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe it means, I, I, I don't think that's actually so, so dangerous. I mean, this guy vanishes when one, two are the same, right? I, I, think, uh, I think that's actually probably not, not so much an issue. So these guys become collinear. I'm sure you, this is some factorization and you get back your four point, your four point, uh, four point guy. No, but, but, but there is actually, there's something, this, this doesn't vanish. This part doesn't vanish when you go to three dimensions. This part does, right? So, so this explodes when you go to three dimensions. Exploring via cuts, uh, but yeah. So so if you read, <laughs> so this is this is a paper with uh, with Henrik Johansson, five point multi loop, uh, two thousand eleven. Henrik, uh, um, yeah, exploring by cuts. But it turns out this is exactly what Freddie wrote down from dual conformal symmetry. It's exactly what Zvi wrote down in the 90s when he was looking at uh, self-dual stuff and dimension shifting. This is, this is the venerable, this is the venerable dressing for a pentagon, um, for n equals four. And it turns out that it, as, lo <laughs> as long as you're not introducing spurious, uh, if you can have manifest, if you can have manifest power counting and you're not gonna introduce spurious momenta, and you have no loop momenta, contact turns to move around, you are gonna land on the color kinematic satisfying representation, right? The, the only way to move, the only way they wouldn't have gotten at four point this and, uh, you know, the two loop four point, right? There's no loop momenta. Right in the manifest in the manifest power counting representation at Yang Mills. So there's no contact points to move stuff around. So you're going to land on the color kinematic satisfying representation. Same here. A helicity of plus one for all particles. It is, it is related to, but okay, so here, oh, sorry. I didn't mention what this guy was, right? Do you, do you know what this guy is? Yeah? Um, so this is, this is the thing that's encoding my external state in N equals four. It is my, my uh, it, it is my MHV, uh, you know, standard, uh, standard Grassmann delta function. Um, let me, you know what, let me just take a second to rewrite this guy. So I'm gonna absorb, I'm gonna absorb this guy and this stuff into the standard super MHV amplitude, A, one, two, three, four, five, right? This turns into S12, S23, S34, S45, S51. I'm gonna multiply both sides by um, top and bottom by epsilon. So I'm going to have an epsilon here, one, two, three, four, five. I think I probably forgot an i when I absorbed this into super amplitude. And then I'm going to have, ha uh -huh, the relevant gram determinant for a five point interaction, sitting in the denominator, suggestively so. Okay. So this is, this is, uh, did I really write one, two, three, four, five? Sorry, one, two, three, four. Um, okay.
Good. So this is this is this is beta. I haven't done anything. It's still it's still a four-dimensional object. This is defined only in four dimensions. This is defined only in four dimensions. <coughs> but but it turns out uh, uh, so 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 you can see that that this guy that any ansatz right like this beta divided by a Mandelstam invariant is not going to be of this form. But you can try it anyway. And you should, and you'll find that it also forms a fine, satisfying representation for five point, satisfying uh, cut conditions, satisfying the Jacobi relations, which I have erased. Or, well, I have one of them left still down here. Um, yeah, and... Should I write? I can write him down because he doesn't take a lot of work. He's actually he's he's, he's far more compact uh, than the other guy. Turns out, and five comma two so is five point, but it's the second numerator that satisfies. You guys are lucky, those of you who are in Europe, because many of my favorite collaborators are now in Europe, and some of them have been for a while. So Henrik Johansson is going to be, he was at Seclay, now he's going to be at CERN, and Johannes Brodel, coming back from Stanford, now he's going to be at Zurich, which isn't so far from here. So you sh I encourage you to look them up. In any case, I got tired of writing. But the numerator is something of this form. Nice, symmetric, nice, symmetric, and, and this guy. Um, sorry, well, no, no, sorry. This is, this is an alternate five-point tree-level satisfying uh, numerator. Jacobi satisfying amplitude-encoded representation. Ah, it's not yet amplitude-encoded. It's still beta, still beta encoded, right? But turns out these guys, these guys, these two numerators, they both satisfy. Um, uh, they both satisfy this, so you can set them on both sides of the equals and solve for these betas in an amplitude encoded way, and so you can get uh, so you can get beta just expressed in terms of gram determinant, so products of SIJs, and scattering amplitudes, right? And none of these epsilons, and this generalizes well to D dimensions, and you can check satisfies, um, when you plug it into here, satisfies, uh, satisfies all uh, D dimensional requirements according to the N minus three factorial relations. So, so, this was actually a very sneaky way of getting a d-dimensional generalization, or at least a guess as to a good d-dimensional generalization of what beta could be, is solving this at tree level. But in any case, since these are independent, you can write, you can write an A, B, C, D, E as if I call this guy N1, and I call this guy N2 as N1 plus alpha, you know, alpha 1 minus alpha N2. And so you've got a number, you've got a parameterized gauge freedom between these two solutions. It turns out, I remember I mentioned that um, ZV and friends had played around with the Lagrangian to tag to hard code by adding zero to the Lagrangian um, color kinematic satisfying numerators to come out of Feynman rules. And they came out symmetric. And there was 
a one parameter degree of freedom in, uh, in that solution. Um, that, of course, came out not in this uh, amplitude encoded representation, but in terms of polarization tensors and kinematic invariants and stuff like that. But, uh, but yeah, okay. Um, I think I'm running out of steam for writing things on the board. Uh, are there any questions? Yes. Huh? Yeah. Oh, okay, this, this stuff? Yeah. Okay. So I'm saying, yeah, so because I had, because I had uh, two completely independent solutions, two, two independent numerator functions, two functions that both independently and quite distinctly uh, satisfied appropriate numerators for, um, for the five-point amplitude, I was able to combine them, right? Uh, yeah, that's all. That there is, there was some, there's some freedom to move. There's a parameter that's unfixed by, by the requirement of Jacobi and by the requirement of symmetry. So, <clears throat> so after, uh, so the procedure I gave you this morning that doesn't find symmetric representations, just finds any representations and leads all gauge freedom manifest has a tremendous amount of gauge freedom at five points. Functional gauge freedom where you've got things that could be anything. Your grandmother's birthday, it all cancels after, after you plug things in. After you impose symmetry, you use up a lot of this gauge freedom, a lot of the functional gauge freedom. This is not going to depend, and I don't think happily depends on kinematics. This is going to be a number, right? But there's still some freedom that's not been, that's not been tagged by, uh, it's not been pinned down by Jacobi and not been pinned down by the imposition of symmetry. Um, the first time we found gauge freedom at multi loop after imposing Jacobi, I have to say, is a three loop five point. Uh, so so all, the, all, the other, all the other Jacobi satisfying representations at multi loop we found so far have had no gauge freedom with the onsatz we've used. Could there have been gauge freedom that we missed because we weren't using broad enough onsatz? Quite possibly, right? So when I ask you, do you know of any good ways to see if after you find a solution that works, right, maybe there's another solution sitting around, how do you know you've exploited all the residual gauge freedom? That was an earnest question and something to think about. Maybe it's an exercise. Yes. So I have a line of cross transition that I call it a free metaphor. It goes on to the answer of one, two, three, four. That term is carrying it out in the line of time of the film in one place. I think it starts from serial and your neo serial, and this four serial is it. So it has highly symmetry, but the, in the intermediate space where you go, sometimes it's highly it out. Numerators? Um, yeah, I don't know. Is there a follow-up question? <laughs> Sorry. No, I, I, don't, I, I, I don't know if there's inherent meaning to it. I, I know that in the early days when people were first writing down uh, five-point five point multi-loop uh, amplitudes, the first bit they would do is the parity even bit. Right, and they left the parity odd as a headache. And then they came along later and cleaned it up a little bit. But there are parity odd and parity even bits to, to the scattering amplitudes. Uh, I, I don't know what, what it means. Yeah, so I have some hard questions. Okay. Uh, now you said that at five points, you basically have these two choices for numerators, which satisfy all the properties you want. Mm -hmm. So does that mean that this these would be all at five points, or could there still be some that you missed? And then hmm. the game would be if I answered that already, but I just realized. And the second, uh, the second question But I wouldn't have known it if V hadn't done that calculation, okay. actually. And, you know, I, I'm still, I, you know, I still don't, I'm not actually, sh you know, I think, I think it's the same parameter. Okay. I, I expect it to be, but, you know. And, and the follow-up question is, if you extend this to a high, high number of, of points, then would you expect that, for instance, six points, you get two parameter freedoms and, and so on? <laughs> 
Um, yeah, I, I, I don't I don't have a counting argument, and I've got some. I've got. Uh, okay, let me, let me tell you the good news and the bad news. Okay, um, the good news is that the goal. Well, okay, so this this is the other thing too. The, part of the reason to play these games at least for me, is to get good at playing these games for loop level. And I've had a loop level problem that's been annoying me, and so sometimes I'll step away from it and I'll go play these games. Um, in a sense, you could say, well, come on, we've known what all the, 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 the scattering amplitudes at tree level have been, we've known them forever, right? And, and that's absolutely true. So, so in, 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 in some sense, all you're doing, perhaps, explore, scientifically, is gaining maybe some insight into the structure. Maybe you get some, if, okay, the fact, ah, turns out this guy, this guy does not generalize to loop level, but this guy is sitting on top of the ground determinant to the second guy who's sitting on top of the ground determinant does, right? And so you can conjecture that uh, higher and higher and higher and higher and higher uh, multiplicity, they'll all be sitting on these ground determinants which, in a sense, does actually make sense because it starts filtering out maximal cuts below certain dimensions. It just says, don't go there. Don't try to cut these below certain dimensions, which is, which is fine. Um, OK. Symmetry, symmetry. OK, so how many graphs, how many unique graphs we have? We have n mi what, 2n minus 5 double factorial. That's a lot of graphs, right, as, as n goes up. Um, you can say, well, all right, but how many, how many independent uh, Jacobi basis guys do we have? So yeah, n minus 2 factorial. That's still, that's still a big number as n gets bigger. Um, it turns out you can always Jacobi from no matter how complicated a tree structure you have, complicated tree structure, you can always Jacobi down such that your basis are the half ladders, these half ladder guys, right? Great. If you can come up with a symmetric representation of this guy, then you've expressed everything in one function, right? One function at each multiplicity, not 2n minus 5 double factorial or n minus 2 factorial functions. And so that's one reason you might be inspired to go hunting for symmetric representations at tree level, besides wanting to get exposure to, to insights to loops. Because there is a tremendous amount of redundancy. And so that's the, the story that's coming out is there is a tremendous amount of redundancy in gauge series. And this wasn't, again, I said, oh, it's the same numerator shows up in the maximally supersymmetric theory at loop level. But, but this all is at tree level. This is, this is just gluons, right? So. Um, so yes, there's, so there's, there's a story about redundancy uh, of, of, of information in gauge theory that you're proving by, by, by looking at this. Now, ask me, what's the highest multiplicity I know symmetric tree-level representation? It's six-point MHV in, in four dimensions. I don't know the seven-point. I don't know the eight-point. I don't know the d-dimensional six-point or uh, even next MHV at six-point. I suspect there's going to be one. I know that there's asymmetric next to MHV at six point, next to next to next to MHV at nine point, and blah blah blah. But I don't know what it is. Um, so and the coefficients of the it's just ansatz gets large, uh, and and I've got loop level concerns I should be spending my time on, and yeah, yeah. But I mean, I think it's interesting. I think it's deeply interesting. <laughs> Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, so this is the numerator. So, no, no, so this, is, this, was, this, was, this is a Jacobi. So N1 was this rigmarole solution. Yeah. solution. 
Well, the two, the two solutions, the, so they, they, this numerator independently satisfies Jacobi and is a different numerator. Numerator by numerator, this is different than this. And they both independently satisfy all the constraints. Okay, good. If there is this freedom, uh, could it mean that they, they could have another relation that could fix this freedom? Oh, yeah, sure, absolutely. There should be something. Yeah, no, that's I, I, I don't know what I don't know what this freedom means, and I'd I'd like it to mean something. Okay. I yeah. Well, let's let's talk about let's talk about the right way to create. No, no, I I I'd love to. No, because I mean that the the frustrating thing is when you I so I was hoping at loop level, for example, that Jacoby would fix everything, right? And then to find this additional freedom, parameters unconstrained even in d-dimensional cuts, you know, at, at three loop five point, it made me sad. I thought I'd, I'd, I'd reduced everything. Uh, no, so yeah, I'd love, I'd love to, to, to understand what this freedom is doing. In the expression for data, they are both the numerator and the denominator are parity odd, right? Mm-hmm. Well, uh, I mean, this, 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 these parts? Yes. Okay, but yeah. Um, so, I, so I suppose the whole thing is still very even. Um, you know, to be perfectly honest, I spend so little time playing around 4D spinner helicity notation, I'm, I'm actually having to think. Um, uh, yeah, someone who's more, uh, more spinner helicity Friendly? When I did, so, so are you are you very comfortable with spinner holistic? Well, not not often, but I can work it out. Okay. Um, I think he's saying that that the numerator and the denominator are both parity odd, so I should be parity even. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I, I'm, I'm sure it's an interesting point. You know, it's, it's honestly, it's not the type of thing I tend to even be thinking about. I, uh, uh, yeah, no, it's. <laughs> Well, no, it's an excellent, it's an excellent question for exposing the the level I'm thinking about this. At. Yeah. Um, so, whatever it is, it fits the cuts. It is the integrand of uh, n equals four super angles at five point one loop. Specifically, it's the it's addressing of this guy. Yes. But now we have a case where we have different choices for the numerators. Mm -hmm. So if I imagine I have the graph, take one numerator, I have the yes. angles amplitude, now I square every, every graph individually, and I get the gravity amplitude. Mm -hmm. And now if I change the numerators, yeah, this is just gauge. This is a term by term, I would get a different. 
Oh, you will get different turn by turn, but there's gauge. I mean, there's gauge freedom even even in the. So as as I discussed before, I could take one copy that's completely not not uh, color kinematic satisfying, and the other one is, and I will have turn by turn different numerators of gravity. It's just shuffling information between the graphs. Yeah, but I mean, if 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 this satisfies uh, the color kinematics as it does, then double copy the double copy will satisfy uh, the it will be the gravity amplitude, the gravity scattering amplitude. And this is I mean this is actually I I'll say this is an exercise you should go look up look up this, these expressions and try it out for yourself. Try it out for that because you know in 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 the paper in the paper with, with Johannes Brodel. Um, give explicit expressions in terms of color ordered tree amplitudes, you can stick in uh, Park Taylor, MHV. For you can do this in four dimensions, right? Stick it in, take the double copy. You know, you, well, you, you can look up or you know what the five point, uh, 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 you know, two minus three plus gravity amplitude is, and you'll see that it is the same scattering amplitude.